my name is Fiona Selick. I am MD of The Nod. Uh, we are a campaign testing tool. Uh, we provide uh, confidence to make right decisions. So that's my pitch over and done with. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, growth and finding growth in 2019. Uh, it's always obviously the first thing that any startup or um, uh, app is looking to kind of achieve initially. Uh, it's all about growth rather than stability most of the time. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, so I'm going to hand you over to the panel first to introduce yourself, please. Uh, so if everyone can give their name, their title, where they're from, and also uh, what's your top tip for, um, what's your top growth channel or tactic for 2019 so far? I start? Okay. Start. I start. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, my name is Enric Pedro. I am CMO at LabCave. Um, I'm coming from Madrid, Spain. And what was the question about? The question Please. is, what's your top app growth channel or app, tactic? Sure. It's, it's called ASO, App Store Optimization, which <laughs> I guess most of you, you know, know about. Thank you. Great. Uh, my name is Andrew Platt. I'm Head of Client Services at MSC Saatchi Performance. We're a performance, performance marketing agency uh, delivering growth for our clients in a hyper-connected age. That's the quick sell. But uh, a quick tactic um, I would pick uh, is probably how your creative optimization feeds into your, your media optimizations and, in turn, uh, your product optimization. So that's kind of going to be my, my tip for the day. Great. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Meg. I'm from Skyscanner, where I'm a, an app growth manager there. So I work with the app development teams uh, on the growth side, optimizing growth of the product. Um, my top uh, tactic or tip? Um, so I think what we're really focusing on is optimizing the user journey for unpaid acquisitions, so ASO, but also other efforts as well. So understanding the right point in the user journey um, to move them into our app product. Uh, hello, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Beck, uh, the CMO of Triple Dot Studios. We're a game startup in London. Um, we've got games like Solitaire, Sudoku, we've got a fiction chat game, this is the kind of style. Um, my top tip, uh, I mean, we, we, we live and die off paid marketing, so I think kind of continual optimization of your paid marketing is the most important thing. So, you know, what's working today uh, on Mopub, maybe tomorrow is on Facebook. So just continually improving where you're buying traffic and how you're buying traffic, I think, is the most important thing. Cool. Hi, I'm Nadine Sequera sham I'm uh, the programmatic demand lead at Mopub. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Mopub, uh, for publishers, we offer a platform to um, manage your ad network mediation, ad serving, and RTP. And if you're an advertiser, you can access our exchange through over 200 DSPs connected to us. Um, and so my, I would say my top growth channel would be RTB. Uh, it's not new, but it's constantly evolving. So it's something that should be part of your digital mix. You've got um, constantly new supply, um, new ad formats, you've got rewarded video, playables, and so on, and then just ever-increasing transparency. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, OK, what I'm going to do is just go through the panel uh, one by one, get, get a little bit more uh, in-depth in that view, and then we'll take some questions from the floor, and we'll uh, have some final questions <coughs> after that. Uh, so, Andrew, I'm going to come to you first. So, being agency side, you have a really great advantage of looking across the whole industry as opposed to uh, focusing on one sector. Mm -hmm. um, can you just talk us through uh, your approach to op helping your clients optimise um, their growth strategy? Uh, so, things like um, overarching tactics that you mm -hmm. find are working mm -hmm. as, as a whole, and also which channels you've gleaned most success from? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I think the important thing is that you kind of segment it out in the question. It's, it's splitting the, the, the value that you're getting from your channels in, uh, and drilling down into that, and then extrapolating that out from an optimization holistically across your entire campaign. So the way that, that, that we like to, to pitch at MSC Saatchi Performance is actually think about the pillars that you're optimizing within. So one being content or creative, one being media or platform, and one being product or, or, or even landing page that you're landing on. 
i.e. ASO in this case. And what's important is to, is to create the benchmarks that you're, that you're optimizing towards. So if you look at creative and isolation, all of the individual tactics that you want to explore and, and, and drive additional efficiency for, even when you're making small gains which don't look like a lot, but a 0.01% increase in conversion rate, can have a huge impact on your media efficiency. So actually, if you're improving conversion rates from a, a creative perspective, what does that mean for how, you, how much you then have to pay to convert that customer to, for, for your business? So if we move on to kind of the next pillar from a media perspective, again, feeding in creative or the creative insights into media is crucial because then you've got another layer on top of your creative testing, which is looking at audiences alongside the creative that you are delivering. And it's, and it's this constant building. And for a performance marketeer to be, to then look at products alongside creative and media, you know, it's the absolute dream mix. Mm -hmm. So then, um, you know, we've, we've, we've talked about ASO a lot already today. Actually, how are we then optimizing our landing pages to improve conversion rates? You've seen, a, um, I think it was uh, uh, Matthias from, from Philips mentioned an increase in conversion rate of 20%, which is huge. So not only do you have to look at channels in isolation, but you also have to look at them holistically and how they subsequently impact each other, which then dictate the, the, the testing process. And I think it's easy to get um, lost in all the tests that you want to do, but it's, it's essentially creating hypotheses and you are testing and you are creating hypotheses and generating hypotheses from insights from your data, and then you are testing these. So try and keep it simple, but then also look at the evolution of your testing process. You touched a little bit on creative um, insights and how you derive creative insights. How do you guys go about ensuring that, that... I mean, one of the big problems that brands always have is that, like you said, they're testing so many different creatives mm -hmm. all the time mm -hmm. that their actual brand and the messaging that they're trying to get across can start being watered down and watered down and watered down. How do you make sure that you keep that holistic view? Yeah, that, that, that's really important. I, I, I guess it depends on how aggressive you want to be with your testing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so important to have a testing pot. You know, 70, 20, 10 is a model that's been around for a long, long time. But actually, it's a pretty effective way to split out your, your marketing budget. So Can you just explain that to anyone in the room who doesn't understand what, what that is? Yeah, so, so I, I would say 70% of your budget should be focused on the hardworking BAU uh, activity that you have total confidence in to deliver results. Because let's be honest, if you switched everything off and were just testing the whole time, you'd never, well, you'd be out of a job, to be honest. 20% <laughs> then is focused on, okay, what, what's the kind of the, the middle ground between stuff that you have total confidence in, stuff that you're not too sure about, but still exploring the value for you as a business. 10% is just the, the, the stuff that you can go mad with. And it's important to segment that out because otherwise you're going to be judging the, the the, the creative insights and the creative tests that you, that you want to understand alongside your really, really hard working performance activity that you've got total confidence in already, and you're not giving your, your campaigns kind of room to breathe or room to develop. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Mm. I've seen that mistake made so many times um, in startups that I've either worked in mm. or assisted in some way, where they're so... They're so um, uh, kind of wedded to this idea that they should be testing everything and you've mm -hmm. got to test and learn, you've got to fail, fail fast, everyone, quick. You know, that they don't give themselves a chance to actually just let something uh, ruminate either, mm -hmm. e even and kind of let it see, give it time to work and mm -hmm. let it give it time to kind of scale and to see if there is like, you know, going to be growth there. They're kind of switching things off so quickly. It's, if yeah. it doesn't work overnight, right, it's dead. Yeah. Um, and that's just not how marketing works. So you can see everybody's nodding, so I'm glad that everybody <laughs> agrees to that point. Um, thank you so much, Andrew. Nice. Uh, Nadine, we're going to come on to you and talk a little bit about um, programmatic strategy. 
So at uh, Mobob Twitter, you specifically help people with their um, programmatic strategy and managing their ad inventory. Um, for those looking to spin up uh, DSPs um, and get into real-time bidding, you touched on earlier, um, what, kind of, what advice would you give them in the room, anybody who's literally starting out? Uh, so can we talk a little bit about what measurements they should have in place, uh, as well as how to identify and tackle suspicious traffic? It's always something that <laughs> you can't have a panel about. without suspicious traffic. <laughs> um, sure, that's a great question. So, if you are a marketer and advertiser um, who is brand new um, to RTB or just brand new to advertising, who's dabbling a little bit in social in UAC, um, I think there's there's a few questions to ask yourself and a few things to think about. So, I think. One of the first things is just understanding um, your team internally. What is it uh, like? How much expertise and uh, how much expertise do you have in your team? When you want to pick your platform, you want to know: do do I work with a platform that manages my campaigns for me, um, or do I want to take everything in house? Do I work with a self serve platform? So when you work with RTB, the first thing you need to do is look out for your demand side platform or your DSP partner. So this is where that's one of the first things you think about. Um, I think coming to um, measurement, again, selecting your uh, measurement partner is really important. As an advertiser, you should be willing to share your downstream events uh, that your measurement partner is going to uh, track for you with your DSP. So let's not forget that the DSP, whether it's managed or self-service, optimizing your campaigns and needs all of these ev events. Um, and then coming to your question about suspicious traffic, I mean, fraudsters are sophisticated. You've got app injection, click fraud, like just name it. I feel like as an, indus in, in, as an industry, we're constantly fighting this never ending threat. Um, so as an advertiser, there's, there's a few things you can do. So the first one is just ensure you have the shortest path to your supply. So question your SSP, question your exchange to understand how are they connected to the supply that they're providing you. So you want to make sure you're working with someone who has the shortest path. So at Mopub, for instance, we are SDK direct. Um, and so that just means there are no intermediaries. Uh, then coming back to the partners that you work with, your DSPs, your MMPs, they all provide you with a robust set of tools that help you identify and manage this kind of fraud and invalid traffic as well and help you sort of shine a light on these bad actors. And then finally, I think on a larger scale, working with exchanges that have um, partnerships with IVT and fraud prevention tools at scale um, and that they can do this across sort of uh, like all of the users. So I think with these three combined, um, as an advertiser, as a marketer, you have, uh, you're in a very good spot. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you constantly have to be aware and you constantly have to question, uh, but it really puts you in a, in a good spot at that stage. And if you have no knowledge of these <clears throat> channels whatsoever, because, you know, often founders of brand new startups, they won't come from a marketing background. They'll come from whatever the, the industry they're disrupting. They'll come from that background normally. How do they approach this without having to, I mean, obviously it's easy to bring in a CMO, but it, it's not that easy. It's hard to find people who are good, who are willing to kind of give up their very nice jobs at, you know, Saatchi and, and take a risk on a, on a brand new startup. How would you uh, advise them to kind of approach trying these kind of tools? Yeah, I mean, we get this question a lot. Um, I speak to a lot of advertisers who have limited budgets with mm -hmm. what uh, with their user acquisition or retargeting strategy. Um, and a lot of them typically will start with Facebook. And I think that is the right way to go. Um, Facebook, um, Google, they, they give you a platform that's very easy to use, very easy to understand. I think when you get to a point where you're looking to really get a lot more scale and performance at scale, that's the point where um, you want to start looking at um, RTB. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely come speak to me if you have questions about this. Speak to the different exchanges and SSPs out there, I think. Um, a lot of them will be willing to point you in the right direction to different partners based on the vertical you're in. Um, just, yeah, typically I think, I feel like there's a lot of the people here at this conference, so definitely ask questions. Great. Um, just more practical advice, the attribution providers all list kind of top networks or top sources of traffic by geo, by 
um, categories, so like gaming, travel in US on Android. So I usually use these lists to kind of identify what's the most important networks to be testing first. Obviously, yeah. Mopub is usually as a uh, source of traffic of one of those ad networks. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, <laughs> you know, make sure that you do your research, obviously, um, but make sure that you've got shortest route to the advertiser to yeah. the platform. Yeah. Okay. Um, brilliant. And start, start, start with the big guys because mm -hmm. they're, they're going to be safer, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Enrique, we're going to come to you now. Uh, so working at Lab Cave, you have your foot in kind of both camps, both publishing and um, ASO. Uh, you recently launched your own mediation tool. Can you just walk us through that and why? Just gonna get a job, just keeping myself busy. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> um, so long story short, um, we were a game developer to start with, mm -hmm. and we realized after many months using several um, mediation platforms, usual suspects, I'm not gonna drop any names, but the performance wasn't great. Um, we did some tests internally, and we realized that our cost of opportunity, that is how much money we didn't make due to many reasons, was about $900 a day with one of our games. And we have over 300 that are like running. So you can just do the math and you can, you know, you get an idea on how much money we didn't make thanks to the partners that we were using. So at that point, we said, right, it may be time for us to start looking into developing our own mediation tool. Mm -hmm. And that's what um, made us, um, yeah, release it about a, a month ago. And since then, we are we increase our revenue by 20%. There is no, I mean, there is no magic whatsoever. Just being um, unbiased and transparent. So we don't have our own demand. We just let our um, partners who are integrated with to tell us how much they're willing to pay for our traffic. And from there, just the higher bidder gets more. This is the the impression. You're throwing around some pretty impressive figures there. Yeah. I'd say. Um, can you just tell us about? You didn't I mean, that, did you? Pardon? I didn't expect that. No, I didn't. <laughs> I, I didn't know, expect I you to say that. I mean, to be losing, you said nine hundred pounds a day. It's not not making nine, an additional you're, yeah, nine hundred. Yeah. So you're you're leaving yeah. nine hundred pounds on the table a day. Dollars, a lot less. Dollars. But still, okay. Yeah, yeah. You're making it sound worse, yeah. but I. Depends on the Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, okay, so you're leaving that money. You're finding that you're leaving that money on the table yeah. just purely because you don't have transparency in the product. Um, and I, most transparency are not being biased. Um, when you talk, my suggestion, if you are a developer and you are using a third party to actually monetize your traffic, um, question why um, your impression is going to that specific um, partner or why your eCPM, your effective cost per impression, is that amount and not mm -hmm. that amount plus two. And more often than not, just sending them an email and say, hey, I think I could pay, get paid more for this impression actually does wonders, but that's, you know, they're going to hate me now. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's, yeah, I mean, and, and the, the truth is, there is, I mean, sure, we, we have a really clever guys on board that know how to get things right, yeah. but um, the fact that we increase our revenue by 20% just doing it on our, ourselves um, proves you that, um, yeah, we did the, the right choice there. So now we're starting to talk to some of our existing partners who will help with, um, with ASO and to actually onboard them with our own mediation tool as well. Okay, so keep pressure on your partners. Make sure that they're, you know, delivering. Yeah. Don't just switch it on and walk away and say somebody else is looking after this. That's right. Um, which, believe it or not, a lot of people do. Um, I mean, I understand. I mean, I've seen so, it yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if you're a small team, sure, you, can, you didn't have enough time to actually talk to ex partner of yours and ask them what's going on with my inventory. Um, and I don't want to get this focus on mediation because it's about growth. But the reality, the, the reality is that actually, if you can make more money out of your impressions, mm -hmm. um, that means that you have more money to actually invest on doing and other growth. strategies. So, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and on the growth side, um, yeah, we mostly focus on doing um, app store optimization. Unfortunately, for um, guys like Mopa, for instance, we barely spend any money doing UA. Mm -hmm. um, reality is, if you have your ASO on point, as you, most of you guys seen, um, for well, I've been here for an hour and a half. And I think I heard about it, just, it's been constantly about ASO, ASO, ASO. Yeah, yeah. Whereas two years ago, barely anyone spoke about it. Yep. So it's an interesting um, shift towards that. Unfortunately, it means more competitors to us, but uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like this young man here. That young um, man there. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, let's talk a little bit about ASO then, because mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. When I was here, when I 
was here in 2016, there were like three talks on it, and that was it, if that. And really great talks, but really insightful. But it suddenly everybody's kind of woken up to it. Um, but there are lots of kind of pitfalls and easy mistakes being mm-hmm, made. Mm-hmm. What are the most common mistakes you see from your clients? You actually guys mentioned it before. Um, just letting letting your campaign breathe, um, or you do like a keyboard research and you change some keywords. Uh, fill the pregnancy plus app. Um, um, you actually mentioned it. Uh, we left that keyword sit there for three months because we didn't have enough traffic. Let it sit there and let it, let's see what happens. If your research is done properly, um, the most more often than not, most of our partners um, fail on just letting things, you know, mm-hmm. cooked and just get it get it right. Too that's, quick to change. That's right. And as well as doing a, a lot of A/B testing, um, as Andrew mentioned, uh, an increase on a what you said two percent or three percent, a, a small increase on a conversion rate seems like really tiny. And when we talk to our partners, we say, hey, you know, thumbs up, we increase our um, your CRO by one point five percent, and they're like one point five. That's you know, that's, yeah. that's crap. But reality is one point five out of a hundred thousand impressions you might have a day or and potential installs. That means an additional thousand installs that you're gonna get out of that um, improvement. So definitely let first one let you know, let let your research. Do this job and see what happens, and to do a lot of um, AV testing because small it's ASO is about adding sev- quick win, not quick wins, but several wins that allow you to just get um, better results on organic. Okay, um, so we talked about the ASO camp because, uh, like I said, you've got your foot in kind of both publishing and ASO. Just let's talk about the publishing a little bit. Mm-hmm. How do you go as go about monetizing your apps? Because I've been to these events like for a couple of years now, and um, the people who generally are in the audience who've paid for their ticket um, are here because they've got a product and they just don't know how to make money from it. That's that's more often than not the the, the issue. And what happens is that my, my suggestion would be, uh, so, if you're a big brand and you have big pockets, you're not going to worry about that. Maybe you're just going to worry about your job because you know if you're not prof- your department is not profitable, they might just cut it off. If you're a small team, you definitely want to work on that. And when a, a developer, because we deal with a lot of game developers as well, since we're game developers, a lot of indie developers, which might not apply to some of you, but you, some of you guys are startups. If you come to me and you say, hey, Enrique, I have a great app, but I don't know how to many, make money out of it, just stop doing it. You're like you're gonna fail. Like 98 percent of the time, those guys don't that aren't working anymore on that app because I didn't have money to actually keep working on that. So um, my my suggestion there, um, just definitely get um, your revenue sources. On, you know, you definitely want to think about how you're gonna make money out of a in-app purchases, which I guess um, Mark can tell you a bit more about that afterwards, or b working out on on how, what ads you display and how you monetize your existing audience. Okay. Great. Um, thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Meg, uh, let's come on to you. Uh, as the Senior App Growth Manager um, at Skyscanner, you work predominantly with uh, products um, and developing that product uh, to kind of drive incremental growth <coughs> rather than going out into different channels and things like that. Yes. Um, so what are the tactics or platforms you've pro- that have provided best success for that kind of incremental growth? Yeah, so I think talking about tactics um, within the product side, we're looking a lot at the, how the users are interacting with our product. So mm-hmm. um, Skyscanner is a product that goes across uh, devices. So we are across large screen, desktop, we're mobile web, or app. So a lot of what um, we're looking at is we're trying to understand how our users interacting differently with the product on different devices, um, different times of day, um, to understand the best time that we want to move them across to the app to get a really seamless experience. So rather than trying to just throw all our efforts at app acquisition and drive everybody into the app at all times, which could result in a really disjointed experience or a user just wants to do something really quickly um, and we're kind of forcing them through an app install flow, that's maybe not the best time to do it. So Mm -hmm. we're trying to really understand at what point in that user journey can we give them more value or an equal value in the app and we can start to really um, move that flow really seamlessly across into the app product. So we're doing things like looking at user data, but also doing user research interviews, speaking to users. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the feedback they're volunteering to give us, and we're trying to understand um, at what point um, perhaps it is our web product is better for that user at that specific point in time, and we'll Mm -hmm. decide not to move them to the app and not Mm -hmm. to encourage that at that point, so that later on in their journey, we can encourage it and make it a more seamless um, transition across to the app where we can then hopefully serve their needs better at that time. That's really interesting. Um, there are a lot of products, consumer products specifically, that will have multi kind of 
platforms or channels, um, as it were, yeah. and trying to connect them is always the hardest thing to do and trying to understand if you're double counting your users or yes. you know what do if, if someone's downloaded the app what value are they still are they still using the website and when and why um what kind of tracking systems are you using to to understand that user journey i think it's something we're still working on um because our product inherently is not um, login mandatory, so login mm -hmm. is optional. So we see different levels of login across different devices. So, I mean, the, the kind of golden ticket is the user that logs in on every device they go to, and that's a really easy tracking solution yeah. for us. But Who does that? Yeah. Anyone <laughs> ever? No. So I think, I mean, it's pretty obvious that that's not um, a large cohort of our mm -hmm. users. And we often find that those users don't tend to represent all of our travelers because the user that does log in across all devices perhaps is some super user that mm -hmm. might not represent all travelers. So we can't use the data that we get from those users to kind of estimate all travelers. Mm -hmm. So it's something we're still working on and we're still trying to really understand um, what, what we can look at as user value versus kind of an app user value and a web user value, for example. So um, there's a number of things we're looking at um, and to look at sort of things like the health of our app um, and the health of our web product. Uh, we look at things um, like we're trying to start to work on cross-device attribution, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that's a constant learning place for us, um, yeah. and we're, it's, we're still working on it. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that. I was flying, I flew with, I flew with an EasyJet on my way here from Madrid. I actually did a, you, know, you can check my Twitter account and you will see how I'm complaining about it to EasyJet. I did my, <laughs> I did my boarding through you know, the desktop, and then I, I got the app. And I logged in, and they asked me to uh, input my details again, mm -hmm. my passport details and everything else. Like, well, but I already checked in. You already know that I'm Enric. This is my passport. And the point was, like, why do I have to input all my details again while they have the app? I just want to get my boarding pass through my app right away, yeah. which did not happen. So if anyone from here is from EasyJet, I'm sorry, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your app situation is crap. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's a quick win. Yeah, but it's true. you can see all the easy jet people. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, it's it's a really difficult thing to achieve. I think um, it's also a very difficult thing to kind of. Uh, be able to portray success back to the business when, mm -hmm. you, when you're dealing with all of these different kind of user journeys. Um, what kind of... Sorry, I'm going a little bit off-piste here. Okay. Um, so I'm grilling Meg a little bit, guys. So if she starts to sweat, that's why. <laughs> um, uh, what kind of metrics do the, does the business find acceptable when you're saying kind of this, this is how we're gleaning success from these different channels and these user journeys? Um, so I think it depends who you speak to in the business and what they right. find successful. Fair enough. Um, but uh, one of the, so I think historically um, at Skyscanner, we've focused probably at over optimizing on installs and um, that app acquisition channel. Um, rather, and now we're kind of getting uh, smarter and more sophisticated at how we look at success of acquisition. Mm -hmm. So how successful are those users in our product? Are they kind of reaching those success points that we're building for them? Um, or are we building the completely wrong thing, for example? So um, the more sophisticated we get, we can start to look at um, or start to understand the issues that we're having within those cross-device channels. So um, we, we've all been that person that's at lunchtime at work and is searching for something on their work computer and then pick up their phone on the journey home and continue searching and then I don't know go home and chat to your partner about it and then a week later log on to your desktop at home and, and finish that and that's not an easy journey for us to match up and to yeah. reflect that back to the business as success is not it's not super easy for us and it's something that we're working on right now is how can we make sure that when a user revisits our product it's not kind of starting from scratch but we're kind of picking up where they left off and I think that's a really important thing for us to do yeah. so um, for example when we're looking at the the health of our app uh, we're looking at things like um, quick ratio is one of the uh, metrics that we're focusing mm -hmm. on at the moment um, so quick ratio is we're looking at our new users and re-engaged users um, over churned users, so that gives us a kind of num a numerical value. Mm -hmm. And when that numerical value is higher than one, it means that our app business is healthy and growing. Um, so as long as our web business is sustaining and our app business is growing, we can look, kind of measure them up together. So rather than kind of only looking at the problems of not being able to measure a user across devices, I think we look at our different businesses and if we're kind of addressing those user problems and they're hitting those success points in the app mm -hmm. um, and then we can see our product is healthy and growing, then I think it's, it's, a, yeah. good, it's a good signal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this idea of having 
um, agreed success points throughout all of your different channels is, you know, is, uh, I mean, not just great, but it's kind of imperative to be able to show success back to the business. Because yeah. I think as marketers, that's one of the hardest things to do uh, is to kind of go, OK, guys, so I'm trying to explain this whole sphere of marketing, which most, you know, I mean, they won't not understand it, obviously. But if you're talking to a VC board, for instance, they probably don't understand the nuances of it and the, you know, the techniques and the, the ideas behind it. Mm -hmm. But if you can say, OK, we've agreed that these are the success points, and this is how we're incrementally changing them. Yeah. That's a different story, isn't Definitely. It? And I think what we've tried to do is understand that what a user wants at different points and on different platforms are different things. So we're not trying to reflect the web success point in the app and that because that's not what users or travelers want. Yeah. So we have to kind of understand the different needs and different user problems mm -hmm. um, at what on does different success platforms. Mean? Exactly. Yeah. So success for somebody working on our desktop product might be completely different for success for one of the app development teams, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you for that, Meg. Sorry for grilling you. It's okay. Um, I'm going to grill Mark instead now. Oh, uh, Mark, okay. so we're just talking about success. <laughs> a little, little hooray here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit harsh. <laughs> uh, just talking about success and how, you know, you compete in a really difficult marketplace. Uh, you guys published Solitaire app. That's a pretty competitive marketplace. How do you find growth in such a crowded space? Yeah, it's. Uh, I guess for people who don't play Solitaire, it's crazy because everybody plays Solitaire. It's like one of the most popular games in the world. If, if you uh, search us right now in the UK, I think we're seventh uh, with three little dots next to it. You should try try the app. Um, <laughs> little plug. Um, I, I think you know Solitaire is a hundred percent ad driven business. So you're effectively arbitraging between buying ads and selling ads. And because of that, the margins are not as thick as some of these really large IAP games. Um, when we're not trying to build a specific brand, you know, it's solitaire. It's it's uh, it, the brand is kind of out there already. It's just about doing every single little piece better than anybody else. You know, mm -hmm. so our UA has to be better, our creative has to be better, our mediation has to be better, our ASO has to be better, uh, retention has to be better in the product. I mean, it, it goes on and on and on. It's just a continual strive to improve. And then if if your game ultimately can hold people longer, you'll kind of work out the rest of the pieces as long as you're focused on improving them. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, at ASO, we, we've, we've moved, you know, we're pretty happy with our seventh position, but this was only achieved, you know, last week with the, with the, with the change in some of the stuff we were doing there. So, you know, can we get to one? That's really the goal, ultimately. And with all of those different, so you said, you know, doing retention better, doing this better, doing mm -hmm. that, do you have teams that are specific to those goals or do you have cross-functional teams? Because it's something that we talk about a lot over the years is how do you structure a marketing team for success? And lots of people will say, right, OK, you need to take the Spotify approach or you need to take this type of approach. And, you know, I've seen businesses literally restructure their whole team, engineering, marketing, product, everything, to see it just if they can eke out better incremental growth. Yeah, I think how you structure. So first of all, we're a startup, so we're two two person marketing teams, not the not the largest. But in terms of uh, my previous experience, a larger marketing team, kind of how you structure it is related to what area people are best at and what is the most important thing for you. So if ASO is the most important thing for the company, then having dedicated um, metrics person to improve your ASO is super important. Um, I think that answers your question. Yeah, that does. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, so let's talk a little bit about because you talked earlier. You mentioned said you know paid is the most important mm -hmm. um, channel for you. Uh, which paid channel is working hardest for you, and why? <laughs> it really depends. Honestly, where should it people put their money? That's yeah, what they want to know. You uh, know, as I sort of told you, the, the attribution ratings, uh, apps like Kachava, adjust. Um, they all release lists of uh, ad networks and which ones they would recommend per genre. So this is the one I would start with. And it's not only per genre, it's per geo. So, you know, I want to perform in the UK on gaming on Android. That may not be the same network that works in US on iOS for another genre. Um, at, at the moment, Facebook and Google make up a significant chunk of our uh, budget. And then you would expect the rest of the video ad networks to be um, the remaining portion of the budget. Okay. Yep. And how much of your budget do you line to creative improvement? 
it's super important. Even even people think like, how can you be creative in solitaire? You, you can be creative, right? So it's it's all about trying to improve. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. We have a uh, static with someone on the toilet playing solitaire, and it actually didn't perform that well. But all of our <laughs> all of our competitors immediately copied this video. So there's videos that all, all of a sudden like you know pooping on solitaire became a thing. You know, so it's just. You have to find ways to kind of differentiate yourself, and I think keeping a close eye on what the competition is doing. It's it's clear in our industry it happens super quickly. So being able to like identify trends and then react to them quickly is is super important. So we have uh, marketing or art resources completely separate from the product team because mm -hmm. whenever there's that tension between you know if they should improve on the game, it's just unhealthy. So we yeah. need dedicated marketing resources that are, that are separated from the product team. Obviously, there's you know, a closeness between them, but they are dedicated for you know, marketing assets. OK. Yeah. So what percentage? What percentage of spend would you of, invest of your in budget. creative? So if, you, if you're looking at your marketing budget as a whole, what percentage of your marketing budget do you align to creative, but also testing that creative? So in terms of like deployment of new creative, I think it's 70 70 20 or 80 right. 20 rule so is, is, yeah. is pretty uh, significant. I think we also talked about like the volatility in the digital platforms. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Google, their, their whole theory is not to make any changes every, uh, more frequently than every two weeks. That means you have to wait two weeks before you actually can get any meaningful data out of Google. So, if I want to test a new video on Google, I have to load it and then sit and be patient for two weeks. So, um, I guess maybe 20% of budget, but 80% of, of thought. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Perfect, thank you. So patience is the name of the game, it sounds like. It, it's, it just keeps coming up on this panel, people, you know, letting, letting their um, creative breathe. Picture and letting guys their, sitting yeah. there. On their yeah, just waiting. like having a chill. <laughs> um, but it, it also depends on how much budget you have, right? Mm -hmm. If we're making assumption startups, yeah, you, you do need to be patient, but... If you do have the budget, you can learn quicker. Yeah. So with the Facebook and Google example, sure, they want you to wait two weeks. Mm -hmm. It's in their best interest. Yep. But also, you can be more aggressive with your testing as long as you're happy to make allowances for that in, in the budget that you're actually spending. Okay. Labcave, we, um, we barely spend any money doing UA, but when we do, we go on Facebook, we set up five or six creatives, and then, we, you know, targeting and whatnot, mm -hmm. similar, similar, same targeting, and whichever does best is the, the winning one that I actually want to use for other campaigns. So Facebook definitely has the best creative optimization and the best testing platform for creative, but in my experience, it's not always the same creative that works best on Facebook, that works mm -hmm. best on AppLove and then Bungle and Adjust, you know what I mean? They're, they're, they're different placements, so you have to be cognizant of when you're testing creative, of where it actually is going. And you have the copy as well, which is, yeah. it's, it's, it's obvious, but when you ask um, your marketing person or, or the internet if they're doing that, like, what, okay, which creative are you using, but actually which copy are you using from the creative? Because you have the text on top of it and the, the, the button as well, that affects, and then if you're going to use that in Google, it's going to be different, and, mm -hmm. and Twitter as well, and so on. So you got to account for that, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Okay, we're going to um, just see if there are any questions from the floor. Uh, any questions, guys? There's one there at the back. Sorry, I'm making James run to you. Sorry, James. So it's Mike Rhodes from Consult My App. I've got a quick question for you, a bit of a, I don't know, probably an easy one, but a tough one at the same time. Imagine you're an app that's generating, I don't know, a million installs um, a month, so they're doing fairly well, and you had $100,000 to spend. You already had defined paid media, ASO, and CRM messaging strategies. $100,000, what would you invest that in to get the biggest return? Would you invest it in paid media and throw it into your, your paid media channels? Would you put it into app store optimization and focus on that? Or would you put it into post acquisition conversion optimization through CRM and messaging? Great so question. Which one of those? You can't so pick all three. If, I, <laughs> if we had 100 grand, what would you do with it? Holiday. Um, what would you guys do? 100K. I'd start by looking at the million installs that you've already had and where they actually came from. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a significant amount of organic installs, then clearly you're doing something right on ASO. I think the other thing is ASO is relatively free. You can make adjustments to your app store with you know, no significant, we're talking about updating video assets and creative assets. 
if you're spending 100 grand on that, you're probably using a very expensive agency. <laughs> um, so uh, in, in my opinion, I would use uh, paid media, and again, depends on what you did previously. My experience is for 100K, which is relatively small scale, Facebook is probably the best place to start. Yeah, and I, anyone else? Why in? Yeah, just to, just to follow on, on what Mark said, once you've decided that you want to invest in paid media, typically we see um, from the advertisers that I work with, um, a large chunk goes into Facebook. Uh, and like I said before, it's a very easy platform to work on um, and you get instant results. Um, Google as well. And then, you know, obviously I'm from Mopub. Uh, what I typically see is once you, you reach a point where you feel like I'm not really getting... Um, a lot of scale or my performance is, is plateauing or dipping. That's where we see a lot of people come into um, the RTB space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah, I think it's, it's a really interesting one because there's loads of context that we don't have. Um, but let's assume you're doing everything perfectly That's all right, already. Yeah. <laughs> uh, classic agency answer. Yeah, right? it was. Yeah. <laughs> but, for, but from a pure acquisition perspective, look, I think there's, there's loads of great opportunities. It depends on the product that you're trying to sell as well. Facebook and Google have some very easy plug and play models that, that at small levels of spend, it's good to understand where the opportunities are. Also get a better understand of, understanding of what, what creative works, what audience kind of resonates, because actually you're, you're, the audience that you'll capture from paid marketing it is quite different to, to the audience that you'll, you'll achieve from your organic marketing or your, your organic success that you've already achieved. I think, especially in the, in the network space, we haven't really talked about it too much, but ad fraud is, is still a, a big challenge for the industry. We've mentioned a, a couple of times about looking at those lists across the, the MMPs, whilst I do agree but, that... But, but still, even then, um, sorry to interrupt you, but yes. even using those lists, which are great, that's a great source to guide you guys, but um, you know, yeah. working from that, I see some guys are smiling because they know what I'm going to. Um, just take it with a pinch of salt because there yeah. is a lot of fraud everywhere, so you yeah. gotta be careful with that. So, so uh, yeah, that was exactly my point. Is just be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say they're all perfect. Look, stealing, yeah. I think that, that's exactly it. Is you've got to take them with a pinch of salt, and you've got to set up your campaign. You're going to use a pinch of salt to it. Yeah, yeah. I was literally going to say, but you have to set up your campaigns. Uh, for success from for success from the off, and actually ensure that you are protecting that budget and protecting the way that it's being spent by understanding the sources and understanding the trends in in the data that you actually see as well. Make sure that it scale accordingly, and make sure that you have your mm -hmm. tracking on point, um, and you understand what are your main KPIs and whichever is driving towards your, that specific KPI. That being subscription, in app event, whatever it is, just throw more money towards whichever source is bringing you more of that specific API you're working for. Because getting a lot of installed is great, but ultimately, assuming that your app is based on in-app purchase, you want to get towards that event. So I will just um, throw that 100 grand towards whichever is giving me more of that specific event. Yeah, absolutely. I would, I, I would totally agree with that. Um, so just, I, I used to be a marketing director, so, uh, <laughs> so that's why I'm on this panel. But um, uh, understanding what growth is, Growth doesn't necessarily mean getting more customers. For, for me, in my last role, I worked for a theatre ticketing company. Growth to us was getting people to rebuy, to repurchase. So that's where, our, that's where our growth machine came from. It wasn't necessarily uh, bringing in more people. It was making those people uh, spend more money um, and having, uh, driving up their purchase, um, so their LTV. Uh, I would also say it depends on the... Uh, Ha on the maturity of your business. So if you are using all of the channels that we've talked about <laughs> already and you're confident in some of them, you're not so confident in some of them, um, understanding why they're not working for you and digging deeper into that. Maybe it's around the tools that you're using. Maybe it's around um, the way that you're trying to kind of... Uh, the result that you're trying to get from that, from that tool and that platform. Um, you know, we haven't talked at all about offline media, which if you are a mature company or become it, want to, you know, move on from, from a startup and becoming in, move into the mature space and get kind of really big consumer um, exposure, tube ads. 
worked great. I mean, if you go, if anybody, anyone came on the tube at some point today, probably, I should imagine most people use the tube. Those TCPs in carts, you'll see most of them are for technology companies. And the reason being is that they're really super high dwell time, so 13 minutes average dwell time. So if you've got a new product that you're trying to get vast consumer exposure to, they're great because you've got all of that time to explain your ad. Whereas if you're using, you know, the four sheets, six sheets, 12 sheets that are in the tunnels, it's actually just about brand reinforcing, brand uh, recall, and saying, okay, yeah, I, Coca-Cola, I know Coca-Cola, yeah, I'm, I'm going to drink a Coca-Cola in a minute. Um, so just, just think about those as well. You know, it's not just about the channels that we're talking about. I, I have to say, though, if you have $100,000 and you're investigating in long-tail ad networks or uh, uh, out-of-home or physical branding advertising, I think you're making a mistake. I think you choose the large <laughs> networks that you know they have less fraud on. I, I think really this is the best approach for 100 grand. There you go. <laughs> Body slam. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I, I think it depends on your product. I mean, I would totally agree because yeah. who, needs to, who needs to raise the brand awareness of Solitaire? Yep. Like, no one. Yep. So well, yeah, that's not where, yeah, yeah. well, he's Solitaire, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But he doesn't need to go out and say, hey, let me explain Solitaire to you. Do you understand what Solitaire is? Whereas if you've got a brand new product that's disrupting a whole market and you've got users and you've got this investment, it might be a case that you need to explain what that product is. And a lot of these you know, channels maybe don't give you that opportunity. So, um, elbow drop. Uh, any other questions? James is running someone. Any other questions? There's a question over there or are we good? Just the one? Okay. Uh, we've answered everyone's questions already. Great. Uh, so we've, we're out of time now. Are we, James? Are we done? Can we you carry on? Oh, you've got a question. Hey. Oh, hi. Yeah. Hi. This is where you guys are going to like. Final question. Okay. Um, we've got two questions, actually. Um, <clears throat> actually, for you. How, how did you measure your TCPs? Tube car panels, for anyone to know that. How are you measuring it? I love the fact that you just asked me that question because the startup that I'm managing now actually uh, helps to do that. Um, <laughs> and they, this is not set up. I have And the other question was... <laughs> I, have, I have not paid. Um, so we did that through brand tracking. And people, you know, traditional, now traditional media is kind of like a, a dirty word, a dirty phrase. Um, but if you were here in this, you know, not this very room, it was in a different place. But if you were at, at the um, APS 2017, you would have seen the VP of Deliveroo stand up and do his key, keynote speak and talk about how they were moving a lot of their budget away from... The, you know, the types of channels that we've been talking about, performance channels, mobile, mobile channels, into traditional media because they can't get the ROI in mobile channels because it's, it's so competitive. So um, when, you, when you do have to take that leap because you've, your brand's got to that kind of unicorn phase that Deliveroo are at, unicorn phase, um, which, of course, you're all going to hit, uh, it, it, it's it's about reinforcing that brand. It's about brand awareness, understanding what what it what it does and why it kind of what the product does and why it fits into your lifestyle as a consumer. And so, out of home then becomes or Spotify or you know radio or dare I say TV or VOD as it is now, then becomes a viable option. So how do you then track that option? Brand tracking is a great way of doing that. So brand tracking, if anyone isn't massively familiar, which I'm sure most of you guys are, um, is basically taking a dipstick of the brand, people's understanding of your brand throughout the year and uh, the, the effect that your campaigns you've been running has had on their understanding of that brand and their awareness of that brand. Um, it used to be traditionally really super expensive, um, but because of companies like mine, uh, it's now becoming much more affordable. And you know, it can. They say you should put five percent of your total marketing budget towards uh, tracking the efficacy of your marketing. And you know, absolutely, these tools that we've been talking about are one of them. But you've got to think about okay, creative efficacy as well. More, more practically, we ran some traditional advertising at a games company I was at previously, 
and our focus was making a big enough splash in a specific geo, so in London, in whatever this specific state in America, to try to test out the improvements that we saw. So we looked at organic installs, we looked at conversion rates, are our ads more effective, and we looked at engagement, are people playing our games more because of they saw those advertising. Those are three like practical measures we looked at. Mm -hmm. You, had you, two you owe me money. <clears throat> no. Thank you. Uh, my second question was much better, but I've just been told it's we're out of time. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, <come on>. oh. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Senga. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you.